Working Cows Podcast, Episode 70. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Hi, everybody. It's Clay Conry, host of the Working Cows podcast, brought to you by the Global Ag Network. We have on the show today Dave Pratt of Ranch Management Consultants. They are the parent company of the Ranching for Profit Schools and the Executive Link program. We have talked to Dave twice in the past, once about customer value and then a second time about core principles. And today we're wrapping up that discussion Uh, with a discussion about owner value and how do we determine uh, how we meet the value of the owners of our ranch businesses. How do we satisfy their desires for the ranch businesses that we are managing? So, Dave, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Could we start off with a story about owner value? Sure. Sure. I was uh, just drafting a profit tips column last night, which is what got me thinking about this. And I was relating a story about a absentee owner, a woman from Southern California, brilliant gal, a very good business mind. And they had a ranch in the Intermountain West, beautiful place. And she didn't really, she knew a lot about business. She didn't know a lot about ranching. And you find people who are brilliant in business who seem to forget everything they ever knew about business when it comes to their ranches. Uh, the ranch is an escape. It's, I don't know if it's a hobby, but it, it certainly is an escape, and it would never occur to them to apply business concepts to their ranch. So anyway, so she has this ranch. There's two people working it that she calls managers. That's their title, but they're managers in title only. They didn't act like a manager. They weren't trained like a manager. They didn't do the work of a manager, although... They were being paid like a manager. Their salary, when you included uh, the base salary and bonus, was over $70,000 for each one of them each year. Now, this business was losing between two and $300,000 a year. What they were getting a bonus for, I had no idea. You know, a bonus is intended to recognize and reward outstanding performance. Well, their performance was anything but outstanding. But she was afraid of taking the bonus away. She had inherited that from the previous owner. And she felt if she took the bonus away, then that would be, the employees would take that as a salary cut. That's one of the reasons why bonuses usually backfire. That's probably another topic for another day. She was desperate to get things changed. And she would make these threats. They, you know, things have to change or we're going to wind up selling this place. Well, of course, nothing ever changed and nothing ever was sold. So they, you know, these were nothing but idle threats. The Employees had no incentive to change. I mean, they had a great life. She was hardly ever around to bother them. And they didn't care if the place lost money as long as they made their, their paycheck. Well, she comes to the school and she gets the concepts and she, you know what, I should do, I should be applying these business, business concepts to the ranch. And she goes back saying, hey, we're going to shake, shake things up here. Things are going to change. But of course, the employees have no incentive to go along with it. So she, uh, takes them to the school the next time around. And I remember I was teaching that school. They sat there all week long with their arms crossed like they were going to bat every single idea away, which they did very effectively. Um, These ideas were nothing but threats to them and threatening the comfort of what they'd come to know. So she joins Executive Link. That's our follow-up program where we organize graduates of the school and the boards of directors or peer advisory boards for one another. And... The board says, you need to fire these guys. She was definitely afraid to fire them. You know, where will I find somebody to work the ranch? You know, it's, it, this could be terrible. And they pointed out to her, he fired these guys and got rid of their salaries and the other costs associated with their employment. Because, you know, you got payroll taxes and all the rest of it. So it probably cost over $200,000 to hire these two guys. If she lost that uh, cost and she just gave the ranch to her neighbors to run didn't even get income for rent, that she'd be doing better than what she was currently doing economically. 
you know, sometimes when you run the worst case scenario and it's better than what you're currently doing, it takes a lot of fear out of change. So she, so she did fire the guys and she hired a, uh, another guy, young guy. He didn't have much in the way of credentials except for character references. And the character references were outstanding. So she hired this guy. I don't know what she paid him, but two years later, the ranch is producing a $200,000 profit. And this is a story we used at the school and the young man who turned it around. I have a video of him talking about this uh, that we use at the school. But the real big part of the story is I, I asked people, would you like to know what happened next? And of course, everybody does. Well, she had to sell the ranch because once it got profitable, all the family started fighting over it. You know, I think it ought to be done this way. I think it ought to be done that way. I want my share. I want, you know, I want this. I want that. As long as it was new, losing money, nobody cared. But all of a sudden it started to make money and the owner started to fight. Uh, so they wound up selling the ranch. And the way I'm writing the Profit Tips article is the, the rest of the rest of the story is what happened to the manager. And, of course, he lands on his feet and he's being paid a six-figure salary to manage another ranch, which is what a ranch manager really ought to get paid. The problem in ranching is that we don't re- – one of the many problems is that we don't really have very many managers. The people we call managers are really – well, they're really glorified foremen. You know, they don't do the work of a manager. They don't do the planning. They don't map out stock flows. They don't prepare for contingencies. They don't build a team of employees and hold people accountable, which those are the things managers do. Um, Yeah, so the people we call managers really are just either cowboys or maybe foremen. But uh, more to the point of what I think you wanted to get into this morning, I think the reason the owners started to fight is because they didn't do their, they didn't lay the foundation for being successful. And laying that foundation means to define the mission. And a lot of people think mission is a bunch of touchy-feely mumbo-jumbo. And we've talked about two aspects of mission in previous uh, podcasts. But there's a third. There's customer value. There are the core principles. And then the final one is owner value. What does success look like? How do we measure it? Why do we even want to be successful? What form does that success need to take? If they had laid the foundation of that, preparing for their success i think once the ranch turned around i don't just think i know that uh, they would have been prepared to to take off and and run from there but they didn't do that so uh this is more than just a bunch of touchy-feely stuff this stuff about owner value and core principles and these things uh, they make sure everybody's in alignment before you (laughs) make radical change and uh, ensure that that radical change is going to be successful so anyway, that's the story I thought might be of a little bit of interest. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it illustrates well, um, <clears throat> even the rest of the story, as you said, illustrates well the issues uh, relating to owner value that I wanted to talk about as well as meeting the expectations of those people who have a claim to ownership of the property. And so I guess, how do we go about making sure that the people ha- who have a legitimate claim to ownership of the property have the best interests of the ranch business in mind? Well, the question starts with why do you own the bloody thing in the first place? As, I mean, it sounds like such a, it sounds like a pretty stupid question, actually, but some of the most basic uh, sounding questions are the most difficult to answer. You know, and why, why do you ranch? And people will say, well, because I love it. OK, but what do you love about it? Well, I love working with cows. Well, what do you love about working with cows? And once you answer these questions, it opens the door to other possibilities that there might be other ways to satisfy that deeper need you're trying to fill. I think we probably talked about the difference between positions and interests in the past. But just to uh, refresh, a position is a statement of something you want. I want to have cows. That's a position. The interest is the underlying need you're trying to fill by taking that position. I want a profitable ranch where I can pass it on to the kids. Well, if that's why you want to have cows, there might be other ways to reach that result of having a profitable ranch to pass on to the kids more effectively than just stocking it completely with cows. But it's not until we identify that deeper interest, it opens the door to other possibilities that might help us get where we want to go faster and more effectively. One of the things we talk about with um, with owner value is that owner value is about more than money. But let's just start with money. If we take a look at, let's say we all agree that we want to make a profit. But you're uh, you're a young guy, and I'm I'm an old codger, right? 
And it's enough for me to see, you know, I, I'm secure. I've got money I invested off the ranch. And so I don't need the ranch to really make a cash profit. And I'm happy to have every dollar that this place earns go directly into into equity, into the into building more land, into a bigger cow herd, into essentially collecting more fixed assets. But you're a young guy and you need some income. Uh, so you need to make a profit. You want to make a profit, too. But the form in which you make the profit needs to be different than the form that I'm willing to accept the profit. I'm happy to build equity. You need income. So. Even if we agree this place needs to be profitable, that's not enough. We need to agree on what form that profit needs to take and how much profit do we need to make. You know, what's one of the questions we like to ask people is why do you, I mean, this sounds like a crazy question. Why do you want to make a profit? Well, how do you answer that one? Of course I want to make a profit, but we never think about why. I don't know how to build a plan unless you have a target. I remember asking at a school a while back, I said, how much profit do you want to make? And some guy said, well, I want to make more. I said, well, when do you want to make it? I said, someday. Well, the problem with that is that more is not a number and someday is not a time. And you can't build, you can't build a plan unless you have a target and you can't have a target unless you have a solid number and a time frame in which to complete it. So that target needs a time and a number. Well, how do you get the number on profit? Well, the question is, why do you want to make profit? What would you do if you made a profit? And the process that I usually take people through is, let's say you made a $25,000 profit. What would you want to do with it? I remember we had a guy through a school. Oh, this is several years ago now, but uh, a fellow's name is Scott. And Scott gets in, the, in our executive link program, in our, in our alumni program. And he, uh, one of the guys on his board says, Scott, how much profit do you want to make? And Scott says, well, I'd be happy to break even. And one of the guys on the board says, well, Scott, this isn't ranching to break even. This is ranching for profit. How much profit? How much profit do you want to make? And he says, well, I could get by on twenty five thousand dollars. And one of the other guys says, Scott, that's your salary. You get by on your salary. This is your profit. How much profit do you want to make? And he says, well, oh, yeah, well, I guess I'd be happy to break even. No, 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 Scott. This isn't that. This is ranching for profit. So I intervened. And I said, Scott, Scott, how much profit? What's your profit for? What do you mean, what's it for, he said. Well, if you made a $25,000 profit, what would you do with it? And he said, you know what, we've got some credit card debt. It's eating us alive. I'd pay it off. Okay, great. What would you do if you made a $50,000 profit? And he said that he and his wife had never had any kind of savings. They'd never had any reserves. He said it'd sure be nice to have a couple of months of operating expenses saved up. Okay, what would you do if you made a $75,000 profit? He thought for a moment. He said, you know, I'd love to give some of it away. And there was an association, and I think it's, uh, gosh, I don't, I don't remember the name. I think it's Christian Rodeo Cowboys or something like that. He was a, a steer wrestler and got really badly hurt at one point, and they had a big impact on his recovery. He said, I'd love to make a donation. They really helped me out when I was when I was down. Great. What would you do if you made a $100,000 profit? He said, Without missing a beat, he said, I'd take a golf vacation to Scotland. I can't imagine a worse way to ruin a trip to Scotland than to take golf clubs with me. But anyway, that was his deal. So I summarized. I said, so, Scott, let me get this. See if I have this right. You want to make a profit so you can get your debt under control, build some security, contribute to something you really care about and reward yourself for success as a business owner. And he said, well, I guess that's right. And one of the board members said, so, Scott, how much profit do you want to make? He said, well, I guess I want to make $100,000. But before that, it had no meaning to it. Money doesn't mean anything to anybody. It's what you can do with the money that means something. And so the way you go about setting this profit target, and this is all part of owner value, the way you go about setting this profit target is figure out why do you want to make a profit? It's not a stupid question. In fact, it's an essential question. I don't know how you build a target around something. You know, some people say, oh, I want to, I want to make a 4% return or a 10% return. Why? You know, I'm, I've never been motivated by a percentage sign. What I am motivated by is knowing I'm going to be secure in retirement, having something that I can uh, give to my children, uh, contributing to something I care about, giving a profit share to my employees, getting out from under debt and things like that, Um, being able to invest off the farm so that when I do step back from the farm, the kids step up. I'm not a burden burden on the kids. I'm not dependent on income from the farm and from my kids for for my retirement. You know, that's another thing about profit. A lot of us assume that when you make a profit, it must go to pay down debt or it needs to get reinvested in the farm. 
I think there's a lot better uses for profit than that. And uh, that's all part of this owner value discussion. So it's not just this, uh, it's not just this esoteric uh, theoretical discussion. This stuff has real, <laughs> some real teeth to it. When the kids step into the farm and everything you've plowed into the farm is tied up in that, so you have no retirement outside the farm, guess what? That's a real world issue for the kids. And you don't, Stan Parsons used to say, you don't, uh, when you see the tidal wave coming, it's too late. You know, the time to prepare for stuff like that is way before, you know, 20 years before you step back from the business so that we have some options to to do some, some things. But this is all part of owner value. Where does the, how much profit do you want to make? What form should that profit take? What is the profit going to be for? Um, and that may change over time too. But there's more to owner value than just money. Uh, you know, we put more, the way Don Jonovic is a succession um, expert when it comes to farms and ranches. Uh, he's out of Cleveland, Ohio. And Don says owner value is what you put in. The equation to calculate owner value is what you put in plus what you take out. And what we put in is time, money, and emotion. And we can take out time, money, and emotion too, but we need to quantify, we need to be able to quantify those things and make sure all owners are on the same page about what it is we're trying to get out of this thing. And owner value can be positive or negative. Those returns, uh, those investments and returns can be positive or negative. I remember a young gal in Nebraska, daughter-in-law, who uh, told me, and after meeting her mother-in-law, I believe this is true, she used to, she told me that her mother-in-law tells her what a worthless piece of dirt she is every morning. They, they live about 200 feet across the yard from one another. And uh, her mother-in-law will tell her um, how her son could have done so much better. <laughs> Can you imagine dealing with that every single day? Talk about a negative return. Mm. Uh, but that's all in this owner value equation. There the value is negative. Dave, I appreciate your time today. Just a quick break to thank the people that are supporting me on Patreon. Uh, just started something new this week in the group. Uh, daily theme posts like Market Monday and Tech Tuesday and uh, Wisdom Wednesday and Thinking Thursday and Fertility Friday. So if you're interested in engaging in any of those discussions in the Facebook group, you can join it for as little as a dollar a month over at patreon.com slash working cows. So check that out. Uh, now we will resume our discussion with Dave Pratt. So how would you go about uh, determining who has a legitimate claim to ownership in the in this ranch business? That's easy. Who's who's an actual owner? I mean, if what what skin do you have in the game? I don't believe um, I don't believe in sweat equity, uh, sweat equity. If Unless you want to bring lawyers in at some point, uh, get over the idea of sweat equity just because you work there. For a substandard wage doesn't mean you own squat. Uh, that's your choice to do that, and it's not a good choice. Uh, I, I don't mean to be chasing rabbits here, but this is kind of a big rabbit that, at the end of this trail. This owner equity business, uh, we ought to be calling it what it is, and that's defer or what it should be is deferred wages, and those deferred wages need to be recorded on the books. You need to be paying people what it would cost to replace the people uh, if they weren't family members. And if you're not going to pay them that that wage or what it would cost to replace the work they do, then that unpaid labor needs to be recorded on the books as deferred labor or deferred wages. And it needs to be charged with an interest rate that shows when that is eventually paid. It may not be in, until one generation dies or leaves the farm or I, I don't know what, at what point it gets paid. But at some point it needs to get paid with interest. And one of the reasons that's so important is, is especially when there's off farm people involved in the succession equation, because if they grew up on the farm, they don't remember the stress of drought and the operating note that doesn't get paid off and, and all the rest of it. They remember a fantastic place to grow up. Um, and you've been getting free housing and all the other things that go along with that with being there. And most of the time, the people who believe they're entitled to sweat equity have an inflated idea of what their sweat is worth. And most of the people who don't live on the farm don't see that sweat as having any value at all. So we need to quantify what the, what the value of that sweat is and actually show it on the books. Whether we pay it as cash wage or not, that's not the point right now. We need to show it on the books as something that is owed uh, if it's not paid as a cash wage. 
So if uh, so if if somebody says someday this will all be yours, that means it's not yours yet, and you're not part of that owner value equation. Uh, at least as far as I'm concerned, the owner value is is for the owners. What do the owners want? The reason, and and we're going to come back to that because that is really the crux of the matter. But the reason I asked the question as I did is because you tell this story to lead off the podcast about uh, a ranch manager who came in and turned a business around and then all the kids started to fight over it. And so the ranch had to be sold. Was there something wrong? Actually, with... when, when I, if, if I said kids and if I did, I misspoke. Oh. It was it was the owner's siblings. OK. And you, you got to keep in mind, too, anybody younger than me is a kid. Right. I understand. And I'm old and I'm I'm very, very old. So <laughs> um, so these guys are probably in their 50s. Uh, maybe the, the youngest might've been in the forties. Uh, but, uh, so they were all, all adults, but they were all directly owners of the place. They had equity in the, in the thing. Yeah. That, that the situation is the same though. There were people outside who had a claim to ownership, correct? Yeah. Well, they actually did have ownership. Yes. Right. And so she was just kind of left with the asset to manage it. And then when it became profitable, they decided so was there something that could have been done to prevent that? Well, let's, uh, oh, absolutely. But let's back off for just a minute. You know, when a, a business, that business was losing economically two to $300,000 a year, as are a lot of ranches. And people kind of roll their eyes at that thing. How's that even possible? How can a ranch lose two or $300,000 a year and, and still continue? It's actually quite easy, and it's it's pretty common. Most American ranches, serious ranches, I mean ranches with, uh, say, 400 cows to 2,000 cows, most of those ranches are losing money economically. Financially, they might be able to cash flow. Uh, and the reason they cash flow is because they already own their land, so they're not paying rent, and they don't pay themselves what it would cost to replace themselves. And there's other ways that we subsidize our ranches internally as well. So financially we could actually show a small cash surplus while economically in, if we're looking at true profitability in ranching it does we separate the operating business from the land business to start with and that operating business must pay market rate rent whether you own the land or not it also has to pay interest on all the assets used in production whether you own those assets or whether you're using borrowed money on those assets you have to pay the full cost of labor whether you actually pay the full cost of labor or not economically you have to show it on the books and so when we say a ranch is losing $100,000, dollars dollars $300,000, I'm talking an economic loss. Yeah, you can subsidize it by owning the land and not charging your operating business rent. I mean, because most ranches, I mean, the sad truth is most ranches wouldn't be ranches today, or at least owned by the people who own them today, if they hadn't inherited what they started with. And people can continue on as long as they want that way. This is not a value judgment on their character. I mean, you can be the most upstanding person in the world and have the worst business in the world it's the, the two don't go hand in glove um i just think that people don't make the distinction between economics and finance and they just come to accept that when they look at an economic definition of profit i think people have come to accept that ranching can't be profitable and if you don't believe it can be profitable why would you bother trying anyway i'm, I'm going down a rabbit trail but uh there's some awfully big rabbits at the end of these trails you notice that yes yeah anyway so if these guys had sat down and said, why do we own this thing? What do we want to get out? Of, what do we want to have uh, as owners? What do we want to get out of this thing? When we make a profit, what form do we want that profit to take? What is our purpose in making a profit? What are we going to do with it? If they'd had that discussion and reached those agreements, I think they would have been just fine. But they weren't prepared for profit. So we've talked uh, about a horror story. Um, and we've talked about some theoreticals on how it could have gone better. Do you have any success stories? Do you have any, uh, any stories that you could share about people who've done it well and, and some of the results of that? Well, I, you know, I, I do, I'm not going to put names with them. Um, a lot of times we find people who found they didn't set their sights high enough that they thought when they came to the school that, you know, looking five years out that they thought they were thinking big. And then two years later, they realized they didn't think nearly big enough because they'd already gotten where they wanted to go. I had an email. I think I printed it out. I talked to a guy at uh, when you came to Belfouche in December mm -hmm. of 2017. I talked to a guy there who had been through Ranching for Profit and Executive Link. And he said that 
uh, when I started Executive Link, they asked me to set a big goal, and I've already realized that goal way faster than I thought. I think he thought it was going to be a 10-year goal, and it was like a three-year goal or a four-year goal yeah. or something like that. So I, I, I have talked to people who have had that experience for sure. Yeah, a lot of people look at the school and Executive Link as an accelerator. That uh, you know, I, I, There's a syndrome in education that they call the archway syndrome. And the, the question goes like this. Why does Harvard graduate the best lawyers? And the answer is because they only accept the best students. Sometimes I wonder if the people that come through the Ranching for Profit School, if their success is directly attributable to the things they learn at the school, or if it's the, just the nature of those people in the first place. You know, you're not going to, the school is 2750 bucks tuition for one person. It's $2,000 for each additional person that comes from the business. You're not going to put that kind of money on the table to prove that we're wrong. You know, there, we may be wrong on some things, but you're going to, if you put that money on the table, you're going to be sitting there trying to suck up everything you possibly can. And instead of saying, why won't this work? You're going to be thinking, now, how can I make this work? What are the implications to me? And that kind of person is inclined to be more successful to start with. So I'm certain they get, you know, I, I know they get direction and value and tools and insights at, at the school. I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. They absolutely do. What I am saying is I think the people who come to the school would be inclined to be more successful to start with. And I think in many cases, as much as anything, the school is an accelerator towards that success. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Those people who are willing to come to the school are the type who are open-minded in the first place. Is that? Yeah, exactly. Let me uh, share something else. And this is a little off topic, but it's uh, uh, I got this email on another. This is an email I got from somebody who just attended a school we did. Uh, on another note, I wanted to share something that happened at, after the RFP. I've been getting after my what be uh, what be W.O.T.B. means working on the business. Um, I've been getting after my what be. And I met with the folks to go over and explain some of the financials and economic theory that we studied at the school. I went over gross margins and how we got into that. Not a very pretty picture for us. We concluded the meeting, and we we're all going to take some time to an analyze my figure. My mom is not one to freely issue a compliment. They are few and far between, but she grabbed me by the arm and said with her eyes welling up, thank you for all you've put into this. I've tried to make these books work, and you've made more progress in one week than I've made in 30 years. I mean, I'm cheering, just, just reading that. Mm. Um, but that, that's the sort of thing. This guy, I, I just, in fact, I just talked to him on the uh, phone yesterday. He's getting into our executive link program. This guy was going to be successful. I mean, he's, he's sharp, uh, and he's, he's driven. He, he's going to be successful, but he didn't have, he didn't have the structure or the tools. I mean, the, the, I, just, I just read another article. I can't remember where it was. Maybe it was just online, but, um, an extension guy writing about, it. Unit cost of production. Well, you can't tell squat from unit cost of production. It's a complete waste of time to calculate unit cost of production. There's no diagnostic value in it at all. And yet, you know, as long as people are pushing that, then people like this guy who came to the school, they're not going to have a clue as to how to, how to wrestle with their enterprise mix and figure out exactly where the dead wood is and what are the profit drivers and, <laughs> And, and get things going where they want them to go. They're going to, con you know, the results that we've gotten from the advice that we've pursued all these years is that we wouldn't be ranching today if we hadn't inherited what we started with. We don't pay ourselves a competitive wage. We rely on off-farm income to support our, our habit, and we go deeper in debt. The only reason we're still there is because we inherited what we started with. We don't pay ourselves, and the land's appreciating in value. And, you know, we rely more and more on off-farm income as a result. We're working harder and harder for less and less. And we continue to cling to the same strategies that have brought us to that point, which is absolute insanity. You know, if, if, if you really take an objective perspective about the way we deal with ranches, it's absolute insanity. And yet the people in the seats of education are dishing up the same dogma they've dished up for ages. And apparently we're still <laughs> we're still sucking it up. But anyway, I, there's a, that's not a rabbit trail. That's a skunk trail. Let's forget that one. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned, uh, well, when we started recording, you said you didn't know if you had much to say about this topic. And uh, I think we've proven that is not necessarily true. I appreciate your time today. But uh, well, that's, why, that's why we took so many squirrel trails. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were good. They were good. And they were, they were related. 
but you did mention succession, and I don't want to uh, have you on today without talking about the succession of ranch management consultants. And uh, Dallas Mount shared a little bit about it on one of my uh, Patreon bonus episodes, and I, I shared that his his nugget from that with my whole audience. But uh, I do want to give you a chance to talk just about the succession and and the value that you are getting out of seeing the next generation of leadership of ranch management consultants come up and and some of those things, if you you wouldn't mind. Sure. Um, There are two things that we wanted to see happen. Actually, I guess three with passing ranch management consultants on is one, we want to be compensated uh, for what we built. Although Dallas, uh, took the uh, proposal I made to him and took it to a financial advisor he has or a professor at a college that does economics and business. And uh, <laughs> Dallas came back to me and said, you know, maybe you should be charging me more for this. Uh, that's, and that says something of Dallas's character, which is why I'm, <laughs> it did nothing but cement in my mind's eye that this is the right guy to run this show. Um, but that's one thing. But the, it, and this may sound like blowing smoke to to folks, um, but people who who know me know that it's not. Um, it's actually more important for me, or at least as important, to see that ranch management consultants go on at least another generation. Um, we did a conference. Every three years we do a conference. We're doing one this summer on, uh, it's called Ranching for Generations, and it's only for graduates of the school. But um, the last one we did, was in Big Sky, Montana, and if if one of our clients, a friend of mine, came up to me at the end of the thing, and here's, you know, 250 people having a great time uh, at the event. We ended with a nice barbecue at a a big ranch, and uh, he says, Dave, do you ever think that you did this? You're responsible for this? And and I really don't. Uh, I I told him, no, 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 you've got it wrong. This is Stan Parsons. You know, Stan's back in Africa. He's he's older now. He's not... uh, He's not actively engaged in ranching or consulting anymore. Uh, But this was Stan Parsons' program. And I've been, you know, I had the privilege of being able to continue it for 20 years beyond Stan. And now Dallas is going to continue it for, I hope, another 20 years at least. Uh, So Stan is still having that impact. He's just doing it through through me and now through Dallas and and my other teachers. So uh, there, I, I... you can cut this out. You probably will want to, but uh, there's a line in NASA about astronauts uh, that, you know, you want to have a successful mission, but even more than having a successful mission, you don't want to have a disastrous mission. And the, the line they use, I think Tom Wolf wrote this in the right stuff. He says, don't screw the pooch. Yeah. So sometimes I just think, Whew, I didn't screw the pooch. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm handing it off intact and in a strong position to go another 20 years. And so that in some ways, it's just a relief <laughs> to, uh, to to have not messed things up and built a little bit on what Stan started and be passing it on to uh, to Dallas. But it's exciting to see that this thing's going to continue to go on. Yeah. And I guess, I guess the third thing is uh, my role in the future. This thing has been so consuming uh, of my life that uh, I have, I have some things I'm eagerly awaiting to engage in. But it's going to be different, and I don't think it, I can really imagine what uh, life beyond RMC looks like uh, completely until I until I am in that reality. So that's that's a little daunting. Yeah, very much. I I can't imagine. You know, I'm not I'm not in those shoes. But uh, that 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 is very very interesting. Um, any other any thoughts on what you're going to do? I mean, outside of fly fishing or something like that. <laughs> I don't believe in fly fishing. I believe if you're going to kill a fish, you just go in there and grab it with a hook and knock it, <laughs> knock it on its head, and then eat the bloody thing. Uh, fly fishing is too much art and finesse. I want to go in there and just kill fish. I um, understand. So if you give me a stick of dynamite, I'd be pretty happy with that. <laughs> um, uh, actually, I've got a top secret uh, mission that involves. Uh, well, I can't go any further than that. It involves. Uh, no, I talked to the guy last week and he told me I couldn't tell anybody. So I, I'm not going beyond that. that. But there are some exciting things that are probably long shots. But if they came through, they'd be a lot of fun. So I have to leave it at that. Cool. 
Mystery, Otherwise, intrigue. I like it. <laughs> that's right. Otherwise, they'd have to shoot me. <laughs> and then I'd have to shoot you. And then right. how well, could I do that if I've already been shot? I mean, it just right. doesn't work that way. What about, uh, you mentioned, I, I'll just throw this out there. You mentioned a podcast uh, when we sat down the first time after your, your class here. Uh, is there any, have you thought any more about that? I have not. Um, there's a couple different things that have gone through my mind in the past with all the, you know, I've been writing profit tips for, I feel like 6,000 years. <laughs> um, but we've got 15, I guess I've been writing it for 16 years. Uh, every other week for 16 years, I've only repeated it once. And that was a column I wrote called Three Secrets Santa. It was applying the three secrets for increasing profit to Santa Claus's workshop. And I thought it was so brilliant. And actually, I was just too lazy to write another one for Christmas. So I repeated that one once. Other than that, I've never repeated it. Wow. Um, but I thought with all that source material there, that just narrating those or using those in, as an intro to a podcast might be an interesting thing to do. And then to expand on the conversation or bring some alumni in who who have either applied whatever principle that is or being able to expand on whatever that topic is could make for an interesting an interesting show uh right now i'm so completely engaged in other things that it's a uh, it's one of those someday maybe projects anyway so that's uh that's one thing that's a possibility as a guy who produces a podcast for ranchers i'll just let you let you know we need more podcasts in the industry so uh come come one come all <laughs> <laughs> um and then also, I just wanted to say thank you for your time. I have, I'm also in a transition phase. I'm transitioning to a new church. Um, and so I've been, people have been congratulating me because I'm now becoming a full on bona fide pastor of my own church, not just an associate or youth pastor. So uh, I wanted to say to you, congratulations on the, this uh, next step. I don't know if you feel the same way about that. Congratulations as I do about the other one, but you, I, I think you've done well and I appreciate all the investment you've made in ranchers over the years. I appreciate your time uh, for now three episodes of the Working Cows podcast. And I look forward to future opportunities to pick your brain. Cool. Well, congratulations. I didn't know that. That's uh, that's exciting news for you. Transitions are always challenging. Um, and it's not so much, you know, you, you can even be going to a better place in a, uh, you know, an exciting career, but just leaving the certainty of the known is uh, is always a little unsettling. And so transitions are uh, even even to even positive transitions are are, are difficult sometimes. So uh, navigate it with courage and you'll be successful. I, I always told my kids, I shouldn't say always, but I told my kids uh, until they're probably sick of hearing it. You can make a, whether you've made a good decision or a bad decision is not so much decided before uh, you do anything. Really, whether it becomes a good decision or a bad decision is probably 90% implementation. So go ahead and decide and then make sure you make it a good decision. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. And I think there's a lot of truth to that when it comes to things like succession, you know, my, whether the succession to uh, to what I'm embarking on in the future is a good one or a bad one. That's completely up to me and the way I implement it. And just that's the way it's up to you and the way you implement it, too. Very good. I've taken a lot of your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Hey, great to talk to you. I'll catch you later. Sounds good. If you want to make sure that you don't ever miss an episode, I always remind you to subscribe to the show. WorkingCows.net slash subscribe is the easiest place to find the links to whatever uh, medium you prefer to subscribe to, whether that's Stitcher or iTunes or Apple Podcasts or Spotify or anything else. Any other podcatcher you might like to, to use, there are generic links you can click there that will take you right to the podcatcher you might prefer. So uh, subscribe to the show over at workingcows.net slash subscribe. Coming up next week, we are going to chat with Logan Primido of uh, the Wineglass Ranch. Uh, he's down there in that Nebraska, Kansas border area. We're going to talk to him about a tweet that he sent where he talked about uh, that won't work here. Dot LLC should maybe be the name of that business because they're doing some things that uh, just 
people don't really think you can do. And so uh, that's kind of right up the alley of the Working Cows podcast and uh, really excited to sit down and talk with Logan about that. And I just booked my guest for episode 75, somebody that's been mentioned on the podcast a couple of times, uh, something, somebody I'm really excited to talk to. So uh, in a few weeks, we'll have that episode 75 for you. Got some other exciting developments uh, after that as well. So really good stuff coming down the pike here on the Working Cows podcast. I encourage you to stick around and keep tuning in every week for a fresh episode of Paradigm Challenging Content. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.